Hello everyone, thank you for joining me. My name is Michael Vasquez and I'm with the Binghamton Political Buzz at, at TheExaminer.com. We're going to be speaking today with Rich Pertel. <coughs> We're going to be speaking today with Rich Pertel of the Libertarian Party who is going to be running for the New York 20, the New York 52nd State Senate District and he's going to be taking on the incumbent Fred Akshar and uh, perhaps a Democrat or two and we're going to speak with him about why he's running and what he hopes to do. So, without further ado, uh, let me turn it over. How are you today? Good. Oh. Hey. And we've spoken a couple times on and off on the phone, on Facebook, and other social media. Uh, so, but for those who don't know you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm local to the community. I grew up in Little Meadows, Pennsylvania, which is uh, south of uh, Apple Lake, and where I now live, it's about 25 minutes from Binghamton. So I was born in 1963, so I'm 52 years old. So I went away for a couple of years to Penn State Fast Campus near Pittsburgh. Other than that, pretty much always been in this area all my life, you know, between Little Meadows, Apple Lake, and short time in Endicott and Endwell, so kind of circulating around. But most of my adult life has been in New York State. So pretty much in the southern tier of southern the state tier. as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, in that time, uh, what do you do? Uh, I started out in the solar business in 1985, worked in that field for four years. Uh, that was the, you know, the Jimmy Carter era mm -hmm. rebates, and they kind of fizzled out with, with uh, Ronald Reagan being elected president, so I could see the impact of politics and my career right away. Uh, but then I got into more conventional HVAC uh, engineering since then. I went to Penn State for a two-year degree in architectural engineering, and I got a two-year degree from, uh, or a four-year degree at uh, Bank University, finished up my two years there in mechanical engineering. Okay. So you are uh, not quite a rocket engineer, but uh, a rocket scientist, but a rocket engineer, perhaps. Or I do, I do predominantly building automation. So automating buildings, mostly HVAC controls, but also maybe lighting or, or card access security and things like that. So, okay. uh, just trying to give people a little bit of an idea of what that is for those who aren't familiar with it. Uh, but it's safe to say that uh, we're not talking about someone uh, who's uneducated. You have a great deal of education. You know what you're talking about. In the fields of economics and engineering, I tell people quite often, you know, the difference between science and engineering is economics. Because science strives to get whatever whatever's possible, mm -hmm. regardless of cost. You break new realms, discover new things, come up with new ideas. And engineering is more applied science. You gotta make it practical, you gotta make it economical. Right. I took two courses in economics in college required, and I took micro and macroeconomics voluntary, and I probably read oh, just 20,000 pages or so of economics books over the last 30 years, you know, life cycle cost and time value of money, and, uh, Federal Reserve, all those kinds of things, especially in the last couple of years, I've tried to tone up more on, on, on the, those problems, especially with, you know, New York being what it is, we got some economic problems in New York that need to be addressed. I think we all would agree with that. Excuse me. <coughs> so let me ask you. Uh, actually, that brings us right to the issue at hand: uh, the politics of New York and the race itself. Uh, let's ask, why are you looking to run? Yeah, and going back to uh, you know my my experience in math and economics and engineering and so on. Last year, I tried to get on the ballot, but by the time I was approved by the Libertarian Party, it was already August, uh, and. With the whole process last year, it was kind of silly. They didn't have a primary for the Democrats and Republicans, and then the independents really didn't have the full six weeks to petition. So, oh. so it really hurt us last. It hurt me last year with trying to get on the ballot. Um, but the reason I wanted to, to run last year is I could see early on that it looked like it was going to be Fred Akshar, who's you know career working in law and government, and then Bart Fiel, also a career working in law and government. And I just felt like that, that what the state really needs is someone with business experience. Uh, and that, you know, that's what I have, and that's why I felt I should try to get in the race last year. And it's you know similar uh, attitude to why I'm running this year, too. Okay. Uh, to clarify for people, when we speak about last year, we're talking about the special election for the 52nd uh, Senate District. Uh, and so that's what you were speaking about. Directly. Right, right. Uh, so your motivation is to give the people a choice, to give them another option besides the Democrats and the Republicans. And specifically, uh, another choice besides someone in law and government. Fine. And what is it that you're looking to focus on? What are the issues that you're presenting? 
Well, if you look at the pie chart of, you know, where, where is the state government most inefficient? Um, you know, where's the big expenses? I think most people can relate to property taxes going up fast over the last 15 years or so. Uh, Medicaid is what was driving that. And the New York State Association of Counties pushed back against unfunded mandates that were being pushed down to the county and local levels from the state. And give, you know, give, give NYSAC credit for pushing back and trying to, to you know, put a brake pedal on those escalating costs for Medicaid. But we're still, you know, most expensive state per capita in the country for Medicaid. Uh, doing research on something recently called uh, the uh, health, health provider taxes, which is it's like a money laundering scheme where New York and some other states charge the health care providers a tax, which comes into the general fund, and they enable that. They take that money and give it back to the health care provider and then get a 50% match on the on the federal, federal funds, yeah. so it's it's a, like a money laundering scheme. That's really really a, a shame. You know, it's it's very corrupt. Even Joe Biden, you know, it's it's, it's bipartisan. But Joe Biden, a Democrat in the White House, you know, saying this is wrong. We got to fix this, as well as Republican support. So hopefully, we're going to see something like block grants from the federal government trickling down. I'm sorry about my phone in terms of, but hopefully we'll see block grants, and that's something that uh, you know that the, the congressmen, the senators, and the president have to work on to simplify Medicaid and to, to get rid of the corruption. But the state, too, we need aggressive policing of fraud, and we need to get rid of this health provider tax, and we really need to, to tighten our belt on Medicaid. Okay. So besides, and healthcare has a lot of components. We're talking a lot with Obamacare, oh. and its changes and how it affects Medicare, which then has its other trickle down. So it's not an easy subject oh, no, to go we, we got a whole mess because, yeah, there's an agenda now with the Affordable Care Act to demonize the insurance companies to drive to try to drive the whole country to a single payer system, right? You know that. Yes. You know that. So, uh, so that's working contradictory to trying to get the healthcare system to be more competitive, more open, more efficient. You know, because what's going on is there's people that want the single payer that are trying to make anything other than the single payer look bloated and inefficient and expensive. I mean, my my uh, Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield, I my company helps to pay my insurance, but my, they proposed a 15.3% increase for 2017 for my plan, for my family. So yeah. these double-digit inflation, they're just unsustainable, you know. Some of these have been incredible increases, and I, I know most people have experienced at least 30% increases per year since uh, Obamacare has come into place. So I can feel your pain. I, I think most people can. But that's only one aspect of what the state senator would be looking at. What other issues are issues that you would want as your primary focus? Uh, school choice. I, I, I was on with, the, with Bob Joseph a few weeks ago to talk about that on IBF Radio. Uh, and I had an op-ed in the uh, Binghamton Press last August while I was running last year mm -hmm. on that topic. I think, uh, uh, and that's a topic that's important. Uh, there's a lot of special interests fighting against it, of course, in New York. You know, the pub, let's be honest, you know, the public teachers unions are, are uh, against alternatives to public education. Um, but you got to be careful about that because New York's doing a couple things. They're doing charter schools, which if you look at the Webster definition of charter school, it says that family, parents, and local teachers and so on are supposed to come together and come up with a plan for a, an alternative school system. And then the state issues the charter and approves this, this plan, this, this entity that this group wants to form. Well, it's kind of turned around in New York to where it's like the state is picking some corporate entity themselves without much parental, local parent or, or teacher involvement. And to me, that's that's a perversion of the concept of charter schools. I don't consider that school choice really. School choice means the parents make the choice of what school they want to use. School choice doesn't mean the government gives you one choice or another choice, both from the government. You know, right. so that, that's not much of a choice. You know, they're they're uh, they're, they're playing. You know, they're, they're setting the rules. They're playing the game. You know, to win. And uh, so I, I think school choice needs to needs to come from the parents. Right. And where the other, where it originates at is the key point of. The choice itself. Right. And that's a libertarian concept. Choice originates from the individual. If, if it's some other process that's not the individual's a choice, then you're starting to certainly drift away from a libertarian philosophy. Okay. When, when the choice is made by someone other than yourself, then people are choosing for you. You're losing freedom, you're losing liberty. So that, if I understand that theory correctly, and from what you're saying so far, in terms of health care, Obamacare, would be something you would be against in general because it violates that choice by the individual. Same thing for Common Core, violates the choice of the individual and therefore, you, if I'm understanding it correctly, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, you, you, yeah, because 
Common Core is an example of, uh, and I said that, you know, every time I've talked about public education, standardizing takes away choice. And, uh, you know, Common Core is, is heavily standardizing. Oh, At the federal level, standardizing education, education, you're losing that diversity. And diversity is a key thing with education. Why do we want to teach all kids in the United States the same way? Not only to possess the same knowledge, but to problem solve in the same way. That's what I really disturbs mm -hmm. about the common, common Core math, is we're very rigid in saying, you must all solve problems this way. Yes. You know, where's the innovation? Where's the creativity? Some people, you know, not everybody thinks the same way. And uh, I think it's, you know, you're pigeonholing everybody to saying, if you get the right answer using your own thought process and it's the right answer, then why should that be wrong? Why do we have to, to force yeah. You know, and sometimes these are brilliant students, perhaps, you know, even Einstein and people like that were, were counter, you know, mainstream education because they didn't think like the rest of us. Right. They, they got the right answers and sometimes got answers that no one else could come up with. Sure. And, uh, and, uh, but yet they were, they were criticized in a standardized education environment because they didn't think like everybody else. True, and that is one of the problems with standardization is you do lose some, some of those people on the fringes, some of the great minds out there, those who need help. Both are kind of lost in it. Uh, so looking at your principles, I want to understand, I know a question that's going to come up, and, and there's two very recent, very big topics that we have to address in any discussion about any election going forward, and that would be heroin and, of course, mass shootings. Um, and that would be, let's take the mass shootings first. Most recent topic. It's on the tip of everyone's tongue, and that deals with the Second Amendment, the interpretation of it, New York Safe Act. Um, where do you stand on that? How would you? Well, where do you stand on that? We'll yeah, ahead. there was a there was a meme floating around Facebook that kind of described it perfectly. It was a, it was a picture of the Statue of Liberty with the her hands over her head, you know, in frustration, and uh, it's because it's like what's happening now is you got half, and like no, just an exaggeration. Half the people, or nearly half, are saying we need to take guns away, and the other half are, or the people are saying we need to take away liberty and freedom and, and violate the Fourth Amendment, NSA, TSA, more spying, more, more mm -hmm. spying on, on innocent citizens. So both are wrong. So uh, right to bear arms, Second Amendment, I, I support the right to bear arms. Uh, pragmatically, it's on my, face, my, face, my Facebook page and my campaign page. Uh, I, I want to be honest with people about one key issue. Okay. 1986 law banned automatic weapons. 1986 banned automatic weapons in the public. And I was in the Marines in the early 80s, and the one model there was one shot, one kill. Well, pragmatically speaking, we can go one or two directions. We could try to get automatic weapons to be legal again for you and me, everyday citizens. Or, I think it's reasonable, and actually the, the Marine Corps has gone this direction, is uh, a lot of those automatic weapons don't fire very accurately. Sure. They're, they're a weapon of mayhem, a weapon of sure. you know, If you can't fire it ac accurately, it's not very really functional. So if, if we can't get the everyday citizens to have a right to an automatic weapon, then I would like to restrain the police and the military, make sure that whatever weapons they have can be fired accurately at their maximum firing rate. So if they have an automatic weapon, at maximum firing rate, when they're holding the trigger closed, I want to know that, that is, they will be accurately fired. Because what, be, what could happen to police and fire, or police and military can own those weapons, someone can steal them. No. Well, I, uh, I want to interject a moment for, for that. Um, actually, no one has. Other than people, there is a special license that will be allowed, that will allow an individual to own a tank, a, a bazooka, a machine gun, which is an automatic fire weapon, uh, which is for suppressing fire. Understood, and I agree with you on that. Uh, and there was the law in 86, which eliminated that for the general public without that special specific license. But what is being said as an automatic weapon, an AR-15, is not an automatic. This, that is a semi-automatic right. weapon. And I, I got to be honest, I was initially confused because honestly, uh, uh, I grew up hunting and, and like I said, I was in the military, but I don't actually have a gun in my own home right now. I'm not in a high crime area. I just haven't felt the, the need to have one for my own defense. But when the uh, assault weapons ban first came out, I really thought they were talking about an extension of automatic weapons, but you're right. It's 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 this goofy ban on semi-automatic weapons, automatic weapons. It's typically based on some silly cosmetic feature, like a rifle with a pistol grip. Yeah. You put a pistol grip on a rifle, all of a sudden now it's an assault weapon, same weapon, same caliber, same firing rate. Right. Nothing has changed. Else. Nothing has changed except the other. So that's that's really silly to do that. So yeah, assault weapons ban was a silly ban. Now that I you know 
I learned better like 10 years ago what it really meant. It says it was a silly ban, it didn't make sense, and I'm glad to see it gone. Uh, if you look what's going on in the United States, a good thing in many states is going to constitutional carry, and I support that. So what you have in many states now, 10, well, I, I guess that's not the majority, 10 states, it's moving up, uh, permitless, concealed, open carry of a, a pistol. Right. Right, that's ten that's states. Where this and the comments I've made, you know, the people that want a gun grab after what happened in Orlando is, you know, try to set the emotions aside and let's let's look at the ten states that have constitutional carry. Right. There's going to be firearm deaths from accidents from people using them improperly. There's going to be firearm deaths from suicide, mm -hmm. and there's going to be firearm deaths from murder. Right. And counterbalance to get that, the presence of firearms also helps to retard crimes like rape and theft and so on. Violent sure. crimes, crimes of theft, and so on. We should objectively look, and I think if people look, they find the answer. The states with, with constitutional carry have low crime rates. They don't have the mass shootings. I mean, again and again and again, where do we see the, where do we see the mass shootings? In gun-free zones, where people are vulnerable. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so, but, yeah, it's, it, it's, it, the lot, you know, if you look at it logically, if you try to set your emotions aside and look at it logically and objectively, the strictest gun control regions of the country have a, most, you know, pretty much almost all of mass shootings of violent crime. Jim, Open carry, yeah. yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. and again, factor in also how often people maybe shoot themselves accidentally or, or whatever, but, but I think you'll find if you put all the numbers together, aside from a libertarian viewpoint, a logical viewpoint should support constitutional carry. Okay. Well, I have looked at the FBI data, and you know this. I, I look at it on a regular basis. I looked at New York State's results, um, which are for the last two and a half years since the New York Safe Act has been elected and put into effect. And uh, the numbers of deaths under the New York Safe Act has had zero, not just zero statistical difference, there is zero numerical difference in any region of New York that reports on the number of deaths by accident, on purpose, it, there's no change. There's no change. It's done there's absolutely no nothing. Right, right. Well, are, and the, the specific negative I see about the SAFE Act is because uh, uh, people were supposed to go to a licensed firearm, firearms dealer to get a background check if they transfer a weapon to someone who's not an immediate family member. Correct. That's a revision of the SAFE Act. Well, the negative consequence of that is if someone exchanges a weapon on Craigslist or something like that and doesn't follow the correct procedure, and let's say sometime later they have another gun stolen from them, they're going to be afraid to report it because they might get in trouble for maybe a previous gun that they sold not in, in compliance with the SAFE Act. So the negative, and because what you really want to make sure, hey, if your gun's stolen, please tell us. That's right. the most important thing. But the SAFE Act has the effect of suppressing that voluntary reporting. You know, and the same thing with mental health, right? Mental health provisions in the SAFE that's Act. A big, that's a big one. Yeah. People won't come forward that need help because they, they're afraid their guns will be taken away. So negative consequence. I mean, the, the people that wrote their law, I don't know why they didn't think through these obvious consequences, you know, but... I, I have many words about that, but I won't use them now. <laughs> and some of them I can't say on video anyway. Uh, not amongst mixed groups. Uh, yes, they're a bit vulgar. Anyway, uh, so we have a lot of issues that are ongoing. Now, one of the biggest issues in the 52nd race from August last year all the way through today, we're still seeing a lot of talk about this is heroin. And where do you stand on that? What I suggest everyone listening to do is investigate Portugal, the country of Portugal, since 2001. They decriminalized drug use, all drugs, not just marijuana. They decriminalized drug use. That's like the second or third lowest country in Europe for uh, deaths from overdose from any drug. Right. So it's worked for them. They, they decriminalized, people came out of the shadows. We've got to treat it as a health problem. And if we want to treat it as a health problem, you can't walk the, the tightrope of saying, well, you might get arrested, but we really want to help you. So if we want to, uh, I mean, I'm for total legalization and regulation of marijuana. It's full legalized for sale and everything. But for the harder drugs, let's at least legalize usage. We can still have crime, you know, have a crime to sell it, distribute it, etc. Attack, attack the pushers, attack the people selling the stuff. But if you want to get people to come out of the shadows and get it treated as a health problem, they have, you got to get to, to where they're not afraid of being arrested. I mean, there's always going to be that fear. As long as it's illegal, people that are drug addicts. And the other, the other thing I think when we talked about this last year is that uh, back to Medicaid again, 
is that you know Medicaid and the federal government and so on said you could prescribe opioids for, for, for pain relief without high risk of addiction. That's proven. That was 1996 or something like that. That was a huge, huge blunder. And that's what's created a lot of this problem because many sources I've seen says that 80% of heroin addicts were people that were prior, prior using legal prescription drugs. Yes. So, so uh, and I've talked to people that are in uh, physical therapy, massage therapy, acupuncture, and so on, saying that, that we need to, not that I'm a big Medicaid guy, we spend too much on it already, right. but we have to look at the big picture. It's like, if it's cheaper to give someone uh, OxyContin in the short run, right? it's cheaper to prescribe that in the short run, but there's a high risk of them becoming a heroin addict, addict, and that's going to be extremely expensive, regardless of whether we incarcerate them or, or send them to get rehabilitated or whatever. Uh, I think we should look at in-home alternative therapy methods for pain management, like acupuncture and physical therapy, and so on. Because the people on Medicaid, the struggle they have is uh, they're they're you know they're typically poor, right? That's what whether they're getting the Medicaid. Right. Uh, they have transportation issues. I've talked to people who are massage therapists. They try to support the Medicaid massage, but the clients don't show up. So first of all, it's free for them, so they don't necessarily value the service. Secondly, they have the challenge of getting there. So should perhaps Medicaid consider transportation services for people? And I've actually talked to the Rotary Club and some other people in the area to say, hey, we should come up with voluntary, because there's a, you know, RSVP and other uh, volunteer groups around here that do transportation for seniors for healthcare appointments. Why not provide transportation services for people for pain management that need an acupuncture treatment or something like that? Let's let's plug that hole. Let's let let's give people an option other than opioid meds. Again, choice. Let's try to and give the doctors that option because if the doctors know the person can't afford another option, they're going to continue to prescribe oxycontin. Of course, there's huge corporate pressure to to well, push the the prescription drugs. So. Well, there, there's always going to be as long as there's corporations, there's something that has a need. There's going to be someone who's going to try and right. push it. Right. Uh, and I'm not saying that in favor or, or not in favor, just a reality that exists. I just I want to bring that up um, because I'm not trying to pick a side. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, over in each of the comments, uh, issues that we're speaking about, as we're talking about them, I know uh, in Facebook and in some of the times you've been on WNBF with uh, Bob Joseph, I've listened to you and I've heard a constant theme of choice. That. The public needs to have more choice, even as you just said, uh, even, with all consequences included, choice is still the option. And, and I am understanding that correctly, is that right? Right, right. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm not, again, not putting words in your mouth that I am understanding it. And I want people who are going to see this to understand that is one of your key issues. Uh, how best might you sum up to them? the average person in the southern tier who's going to be looking at this and saying the choice is between you and say Fred Akshar if and if there is a Democrat, that Democrat, what is it that your, your, your message of choice is going to provide to them that makes them say they should vote for you? Does that, does that make sense? Well, I think it's, it's universal. It's pretty universal. I mean, if you look at issue after issue after issue, like you said, I'm going to err on the side of, of giving people more choice. If I have, a, if the option is more government and more power to the people, I'm almost always going to. I want more power to the people. It's, it's pretty much universal on every issue. And, you know, you can look on my campaign page, and again and again and again, I I go through. Pretty much, I come down on the side of choice. Everybody needs more choice, uh, and we're a very anti-choice state right now. <laughs> New York is a, yes, you know, sir. So, uh, and that's the thing, you know. Let's say if, you know, by some miracle I could win, uh, I'd be, what, there's 63 Senate districts? I'd be a libertarian, high pro-choice voice surrounded by 62 others that aren't very high pro-choice. How much leverage would me, maybe I'm too extreme for some people, but how much leverage can I have as the super high choice guy? How much can I pull things in a direction of at least, let's just keep things. Well, Bernie Sanders was the only independent and... Now he's running for president, so you never know. Yeah. And, that, and, and every voice should be heard. And you know I believe that, Rich, and that's why I want you to get your voice out there. Yeah, I appreciate it, especially I, the timing of this. The petition starts in a week, so uh, petition period for the federal candidate starts in a week. Mine starts July 12th, but 
but yeah, that's, uh, I appreciate coming here tonight. It's good. Absolutely. I know we don't have a lot of time, so let me ask you, uh, and I know we're only, we're only barely touching on these issues, and it's not enough time. There should be more time. I mean, we could spend this much time on just one subject and one question easily. Uh, so we're trying to get through everything, and I know it's rushed. Uh, but for people who do want to find out more about your platform, to get more of those details, uh, what website, what's the website? Uh, it's pertelfornysenate.nationbuilder.com. Pertelfornysenate.nationbuilder.com. Nation Builder is a, is a uh, web service that provides... Election web, campaign. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a, like WordPress is oriented towards websites. Nation Builder is built for political campaigns. So I'm not a, necessarily a web guru, so it's, it's quick quick to get on and get, get it started, you know? Yeah. Well, I've used it myself in my congressional campaign. Many people use it across the nation. It's very well known, very yep. accredited. Yep. So yep. Um, it's, a good, it's a good site. Uh, One other thing we should maybe talk about is sure. the corruption issue, right? New York's known for corruption. We got a lot of Oh, how did I miss that? That's how, <laughs> that's how we ended up, you know, where we are today, right? Oh, absolutely. So, um, and that's where, you know, coming from the private sector, I've been, Building automation in terms of uh, public work is highly corrupting. What happens is you end up with uh, uh, statutes such as GML 103-5, which is a standardization clause, back to standardization again. Mm -hmm. It's overused and abused, lack of competition. Uh, vendors know this, and I've seen prices you know, sometimes 100, 200% above fair, fair market value. I've talked to people in procurement in New York that figure it costs in New York State uh, taxpayers like $500 million a year in excess costs on public construction projects from just lack of competition. Well, uh, you go to public, publicintegrity.org, which is a, they won a Pulitzer Prize in 2014. They did a 50, day, 50 state report last year, mm -hmm. all 50 states, and New York scored in 48th place out of 50 in the category of procurement. I invite people to take a look at it, and uh, that's kind of like a hidden, a hidden thing behind corruption. And you'll find like, uh, like now, Cuomo's, Governor Cuomo is an investigation, and it goes back to contractors and those kind of, I mean, time and again, you see, where's the corruption? It's typically contractors, real estate developers, and people like that. So typically, it starts with some type of anti-competitive rule that, invite, that, that allows some big contractor to profiteer on a project, and they take a, a portion of those excess profits and then funnel into someone's political campaign. So, and then try to get more laws written so that they can do more more of those things. Uh, I mean, state contract purchasing is another thing that's abused. I've heard this in school districts that, you know, it sounds good in theory, but it makes sense for maybe buying school buses or something, but you find with commodity items like paper clips and paper and so on, a lot of times the school district, if they use a state contract, besides the bureaucratic cost, they'll be paying more for merchandise than if they bid it to a local vendor. Plus, they're, they're not supporting a local vendor, perhaps. You know, so it's, it's, it's a monopolizing effect because the 103-5 and, and standardization tends to move procurement towards big, the bigger and bigger vendors, leaving little guys like me in the dust. And, uh, and you, you, know, you limit choice. There we go again, choice. Yeah. You limit choice, prices go up. Okay. So, so the idea is to open that up. Open, open that up. That Competition. Up. Yeah, I mean, with procurement, the big things from the, the uh, public integrity at our is that like, we don't even have uh, a requirement by statute in New York to use trained procurement professionals on construction projects. It's, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so you, you have double dippers. You have an architect engineer who's also acting as a procurement agent or someone at the school district who's acting as the clerk of the works. It creates a conflict of interest. You need someone, you need someone exclusively whose job is to manage the finance of the job to make sure things are, are fair, competitive, you know, best possible prices. You don't want to get garbage. Right. You want to get the best possible prices and, and the best value for the public taxpayer. Absolutely. Sorry about that. If you saw a little change, it's lights. It's live. What can you do? <laughs> uh, is there an event that you're going to be at uh, upcoming that people can hear you, speak to you in person uh, to give you their concerns and, and let you address that? Yeah, we're going to have, uh, it's a ways off, but my, my petition period starts July 12th. And the big home run we hope to hit for my cycle would be the Speedy Fest. So Dave Pasek, who's running from US 22 and myself, mm -hmm. uh, went in 50-50, it was $200, not very much for a booth there. So we're gonna have a booth at the Speedy Fest, but that's way out August 4th to the 6th or something. Right. Uh, I'll be going door to door and focusing on Tioga County because I can help Dave Pasek 
for the first three weeks from June 21st to July 12th when I start. Mm -hmm. And then starting July 12th, I'll shift my priorities and people will see me more in Broome County, along with a, a gentleman named Jeff Tillery who's running for New York State Assembly for the 123rd. I don't know so, him. I'd like to talk to him. Yeah, he should. He's a good guy. He works at at t in Johnson City. Uh, so the two of us are going to share a lot of resources and efforts um, for the period and you know, starting July 12th till the end of August. Okay. Because he needs he needs 1,500 net. You know, yeah. you, you figure double if you want yeah, 1,500 because of challenges. Always. So he needs 3,000. I need 6,000 signatures. I need quite a number. It's yeah. it's always huge numbers, and you always have to double. Yeah. That's the big thing. But what I look forward to is uh, I. I look forward to speaking more about this as we get a little bit closer, as we as more attention is drawn into this um, on the state, as people are paying attention, you know how it is. End of the summer, that's when everyone starts to really pay attention. But we want to give you that opportunity, and we want you back to speak more about this and let people know what's going on. Okay. Does that sound fair? Yeah, appreciate it. All right. Well, I thank you very much for that. Okay, have a good evening. You too.